So Emma, in 2011, I brought a whole load of American MBA students to visit your factory, and they and I were blown away. Well, I'm sorry, I missed it. I wish I was there. <laughs> well, you were there the second tour that I brought them. Now I just take everybody. Oh. Um, but I'd like to go back to the beginning, and if you could describe a little bit about where did the idea for this business come from? Because you are not a potter. It was a real bolt from the blue. I was looking for a birthday present for my mum. I wanted to find the perfect, beautiful thing, the thing that said how much I loved her. You know how you really want a present mm. to do all the heavy lifting, really, That's don't right. you? And um, I thought, two cups and saucers, that'll say, you know, we want to be together. So I went to a china shop. Absolutely everything there had nothing to do with her. And it just hit me there and then. I'd have to make those cups and saucers myself. <laughs> right. Um, there wasn't much time before her birthday, so I, I sort of improvised that year. But it had hit me. I, I really wanted to start a pottery. I wanted to make the kind of colourful, friendly, warm, mismatched kind of pottery that was how she lived, was what her kitchen was full of. So you did the thing that the classic entrepreneur does, which is you spot that there's a gap in the market, you think, I'll fill that. But then you did something that is not quite so typical, which is you went to Stoke-on-Trent. I went to Stoke-on-Trent just as everyone else was leaving, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, the place was pra sort of practically closing down. What I found there, I, I didn't know what to expect, mm -hmm. and I got off the train and I was astonished by the mess we'd made of it, I guess. And, um, the sadness that the end of manufacturing was, was sort of creating. And I was really drawn by it. I found it, it very romantic. And then um, when I met the, the man I'd been, I'd had one connection, one telephone number, and I'd, I'd gone to see this one model maker, and he was the beginning of my revelation, really, that the people of Stoke are the holders of this astonishing tradition. And so it went on. But I think one of the things that's so interesting is that you went to Stoke at exactly the moment that Wedgwood outsourced to China, that Royal Dalton left, that companies were either shutting down or moving out. So you were moving in just as the whole world was leaving. Weren't you a little daunted? Well, A, I didn't know. Right. There's nothing like the ignorance, ignorance is of 23. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, what did I know? I, didn't, I barely knew what Stoke-on-Trent was or what a pottery was. But this one contact um, kind of opened my eyes to this extraordinary world. And I walked around his little factory with Sam. And they were making an absolutely standard for the industry mixture of pub ashtrays and, um, and sort of plant pot holders like old tramps boots, cunningly mm -hmm. modelled, and, um, and some mystifying little whiskey miniatures. I couldn't think what they, these little Scotsmen were with all their hand-painted <laughs> plaids. And what I saw was not the stuff that he was making, I just saw the possibilities of his manufacturing. I knew I could adapt it to this look that had kind of jumped into my head of, of a whole dresser full of stuff designed by me that my mother would really, really love. So you were doing something which, again, I think I've, I've seen in a lot of the entrepreneurs that I've interviewed, which is they're starting with some kind of passion. Yes, and there's a really, there's a nice thing. I think we're all very passionate, mm. sometimes quite secretly, about the China we use every day. I think it's really profoundly important in kind of small scale, but really, really important. The, um, there is something of the altar about the kitchen table. There's something almost sacred about the cups and teapots and the plates and the things that you use every day. And I've had a lot of very emotional conversations over the years with people about what their domestic China means to them. Well, there's also something very meaningful about sharing food together, isn't there? It, that's it. And for me, the driving thing is always it was at the beginning when I was thinking about Mum's kitchen, and it still is now, and it is every time I'm designing 
with Matthew, my husband, we do a lot of the designing together, we're kind of thinking about those meals where everyone's going to get together, the family's all arriving on a Friday night, the talking and laughing and drinking and sitting up all night, that feeling of connection and love. I really believe that the pottery can hold that. And I think that the people of Stoke, with their that pride and honor and, and it's, you know, long-held tradition, precisely the thing that was being cast aside, brings just that to my project. I felt, I felt bowled over by the opportunity. It was kind of obvious very quickly what the possibilities were. It was lucky timing, too. You know, it, was, it was the right moment for it. Well, it was lucky timing, partly because if you'd waited a little bit longer, a lot of the crafts on which you depended, and which the business depended, would absolutely have been gone. So yeah. how did you get going? It kind of just... It, it was an incredible serendipity, a, a real feeling of this is meant to be happening, because Sam and I clicked. He could tell I didn't know what I was doing, and yet... <laughs> Um, he was very good-natured about it, and I showed him my shapes, and he teased me about them. And he said, uh, okay, fine, look, what I'll do is cast them up so that your drawings will be actual items, and I'll cast you some batches of them, and then you can experiment with the patterns on them. And I didn't have any other means of support, so I had to kind of work quite quick. I didn't have a deep pocket, I didn't have any, I hadn't raised any money to do this. I just had a, bank, a rather bemused bank manager who'd <laughs> been used... Bad. I was trading out of my current account, and yeah. um, he'd been used to me being an overdrawn student <laughs> who'd go back into credit in the holidays as a, you know, when I earned money as a waitress. It was literally hand to mouth, so I kind of had to get it together really quickly. And Sam was immensely supportive, and he taught... He has that marvellous moment when you're just hungry to learn. You mm -hmm. suddenly know mm -hmm. what you want to learn. And he introduced me to all the, you know, the right people to match the colors and to progress the thing. And I taught his girls then, he had two decorating ladies, I taught them to do the patterns that I'd thought, right, these are the ones that are going to cut it. Meanwhile, I'd forced, strong-armed my friends and family into buying the rejects mm -hmm. to keep very me afloat. Good. Excellent. <laughs> right. Very, very important. They were nice yeah, about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, every entrepreneur needs a family, yeah, right? Yeah, that's capital. Right. That's real. But I think one of the early decisions you made that was really smart and daring is you decided not to be cheap. Yes, it was, it was alarming, but there wasn't any choice. I had to be precisely twice the price of anyone else in the market because I was buying it from a pottery, marking it up, and selling it to a range of gift shops. I found about 120 shops in my first year. And um, so people were <gasps> very shocked by the price, but they really wanted it. And actually, that kept the scale of the business such that I could cope with it. I think if... It, you know, it came about just right. There w I think there was a lot of serendipity in this, a lot of luck. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff that you've forgotten because now you've moved on to other pastures <laughs> as the company has grown. But, I mean, you were keeping alive both the traditions in Stoke and you were creating jobs and you were bucking the market in saying, I'm not going to do the race to the bottom. I am going to price my stuff and people are going to buy it because they care about design. And... What could be more boring than making the cheapest mug? Right. I mean, what could be duller? And that seemed to be what the city was kind of being given up for. Um, I wanted to make the loveliest mug, the cups that nobody could resist, that had palpable love and value. And that turned out to be right, definitely. And, I mean, I, I, the commitment was first just to... Um, to get Sam to make the things for me, buy them off him and sell them on. And I turned up one day, and uh, things were not looking so good. In fact, the gates were chained up. And he came to see us a few days later and said, um, right, do you want to buy the business? Because the receivers are coming in on Monday. So I didn't, um, I didn't hesitate at all. And I forced my then partners in the business, I th we're definitely buying this. Now, we're raising the money somehow right now. We, we're going to <gasps> become the factory. We're going to take on the manufacturing ourselves. So we really did commit then. That was about five years in. And uh, so for a few more years, we potted in Sam's 
marvellous, shared. If I tell you it was Chemical Lane, was our address. <laughs> you don't need to know anymore. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, um, it was a really productive spot. But we then were about, we tried to be all grown up, and we thought we'll buy a nice big shed, and you know, it'll all be very rational, and we'll lay out a marvellous modern production, and we'll, we'll, we'll grow up a bit. And, um, and what we actually bought was about three acres of Victorian factory. And we sort of <laughs> camped in a corner of it. But we're still there now, mm -hmm. and um, we've expanded to fill every inch. And um, we employ about 250 people there now and um, keep quite busy. And I think what's really interesting, I think the last time we spoke, you told me you've been profitable every year, even straight through our, the economic crisis, the recession, you've continued to grow. I think we prosper um, in, the, um, in the recession. I think when people are feeling insecure, they do nesting, and we come in there with cozy stuff to make mm -hmm. your life feel nicer. I dread when the economy roars, that's when people are bold enough to be minimal. It's not good for me. <laughs> <laughs> but the I other thing I remember me. is I remember talking to you and to your husband, Matthew Rice, and I think it was Matthew who said, we love creating jobs. And honestly, I can't remember of any other chief executive I've ever talked to who said that to me, that he loved creating jobs. I feel exactly. But that's a benchmark of your success, isn't it? Well, it is odd, and it is completely counterintuitive, but it's the greatest privilege I can possibly, possibly imagine. Um, we... I mean, the, the, when people said, and they really did, again and again, and authoritatively and urgently tell me, just don't do this thing. You know, it's still time. Pull out a stroke. Get someone else to do it cheaply abroad for you. The... Um, I think what they were frightened of was the responsibility of employing people. And, of course, there was the memory of, of right. union bitterness and that kind of thing. But we have to go towards that. Employing people is, is wonderful. It's the, it's the greatest privilege. They're incredible. Uh, we had a, a friend came around the factory recently, and he said, oh, this is all very confusing. I've spent most of my working life taking people out of businesses. Right. Um, but he acknowledged the thing that I live every day, which is that walking around that business, there's an incredibly cheerful feeling. In fact, there's a palpable joy that infuses the whole building. So that we've done other things there. We've recently started a literary festival. And that all that old-fashioned traditional stuff creates a very, very, very good energy. People really connect with it. They really understand it. In fact, the factory sort of seems to operate on most people like a sort of giant train set. You have to sort of shoo them out at the end of the factory tours. They want to go around again right. and have another chat. Yeah. Because it is so, it's so, it's so pleasing that you can understand it. Right. it is, you know, I think if Josiah Wedgwood were to walk around, he'd know exactly what we were up to. And I think recently you've seen a very particular mark of success. We've had this very, very, very great breakthrough for us. Um, there was a point sort of about 10 years ago when people were saying, watch out, um, the ageing workforce. Matthew and I looked around, they looked about the same age as us, and we thought, <laughs> can't be a problem. <laughs> and, um, and sort of didn't really worry about it. And, and it, there wasn't a recruitment problem in the parts of the factory where it's traditionally women. Um, the girls are much, much... Young girls, quite pragmatic, and they'll, they'll, they'll have a go. The boys were totally reluctant and, and much um, sort of advised by, you could tell by their dads, don't risk it. You know, and the, so the, the folk memory of the redundancies there is, is very, very sore. And we, so we put a lot of effort into local marketing. And the tides turned, and our first batch of apprentices, first group of apprentices, just um, kind of graduated into the workforce proper. And that was, it felt like it felt like a really special day that they, they're putting their trust in us. I couldn't really be happier. Well, they're, putting, they're voting with their feet, aren't they? It takes some time to take this quite a lot of, oh, we'll see how you do. <laughs> and uh, 30 years was about how long it took. And now <laughs> they've to... seen. Yeah. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, Emma thank Bridgewater. You. Thank you. Thank you.